Our current approach has mobilized a tribal network in the Afghanistan-Pakistan border region that does not share al-Qaeda's internationalist terrorist agenda, but nonetheless opposes our massive military presence in the region. It has driven people into the arms of the Taliban, even while Taliban and al-Qaeda leadership remain out of reach in Pakistan and at risk further destabilizing Pakistan, a nuclear-armed country where al-Qaeda is now based. Rather than continue down this road, we need a smart, targeted strategy to pursue al-Qaeda and Taliban leadership without provoking further militancy in both countries. Mr. President, our enemy is agile. It has a network that spans the globe, receives financing from individuals around the world, and has a presence even in even the most developed nations. We have expanded our ability to go after these networks, working with allies and cutting off the flow of funds, chasing after elusive tele Taliban foot soldiers in Afghanistan, will not defeat al-Qaeda. Rather, we must use all elements of our national po power to target al-Qaeda without getting bogged down in massive military operations with unrealistic goals and potentially dangerous unintended consequences. Armed nation building in a country hostile to foreign interventions and with a feckless, corrupt central government is at best an experiment and at worst a dangerous distraction. Rather than looking desperately for a quick fix to the problems that plague that country, we must acknowledge the limits, Mr. President, the limits of our ability to radically remake Afghan society, no matter how many billions of dollars and tens of thousands of troops we may commit to the cause. Instead, we should pursue a sustainable, a civilian-focused strategy to support the emergence of legitimate governance. Mr. President, this is the surest way to defeat the Taliban in the long term. Unfortunately, while the decision to go to war in Afghanistan was the right one, the exigencies of our military operations are now undermining our ability to help promote such legitimate governance. We have looked the other way when our supposed allies committed human rights abuses, sold drugs, or embraced corruption. As General McChrystal stated in his assessment, we have embraced problematic relationships with polarizing and predatory power brokers, including in the Afghan National Security Forces, who have, quote, been major agents of corruption, unquote. He, unquote. he reported that, quote, extortion associated with large-scale development projects undermines the economy in Afghanistan. Additionally, he notes the Afghan public perceives the ISAF is complicit in the abuse of power and corruption. Some want to persist with our current strategy or calling for a rapid increase in the size of Afghan security forces. But, Mr. President, without a legitimate functioning national government, a rapid expansion of these forces is likely to promote or provoke further instability. Currently, the only face of the Afghan government in many parts of the country is the Afghan police force, which is itself beset by corruption. While our current strategy depends on our ability to address the corruption that plagues the Afghan government, no one has explained how we can achieve this goal. With the input of millions of dollars, international pressure, and additional U.S. troops, we did not even have the ability to prevent wide-scale fraud in the recent presidential election. In the absence of a legitimate local partner, our counterinsurgency goals, while perhaps laudable, appear unrealistic. Rather than further aligning ourselves with this badly flawed government, we should focus on targeting our aid to those actually working to promote good governance and the rule of law. This does not require a massive military presence. Indeed, attempting to accelerate this process with an increase in U.S. troop levels may well be counterproductive. Countries are typically built by their own people over time through a process of building a national consensus. This cannot be imposed by foreigners, especially when they are active participants in an ongoing war in a country that is highly resistant to foreign occupation. And we cannot afford to link this lengthy and unpredictable process to an open-ended and unsustainable military escalation. General McChrystal has argued that we should significantly increase our military resources in Afghanistan for the purpose of, quote, protecting the Afghan population. However, he acknowledges that if we endorse his proposal, it is realistic to expect that Afghan and coalition casualties will increase. Now, I don't think this makes sense, Mr. President. Occupying the population centers of southern Afghanistan is likely to provoke a greater resentment and increase the danger to our troops and to the Afghan public. The majority of Afghans oppose an increase in foreign troops and want to see foreign troops leave the country within two years. Without giving the American and Afghan people a sense that our military operations will not go on indefinitely, I think we're likely, unlikely, to gain the support needed to accomplish our goals, particularly if we know going in that civilian casualties will only increase in the short term. That is why I've called for a flexible timetable 
to draw down our troop presence in Afghanistan. Mr. President, rather than risking more American lives and spending more American dollars in support of an illegitimate partner in Afghanistan, we must find a way to relentlessly pursue al-Qaeda without further destabilizing Afghanistan and its nuclear-armed neighbor. Our massive open-ended military footprint is not only unnecessary and unlikely to accomplish this goal, it may well be counterproductive. Now, some will argue that anything short of a troop escalation means abandoning Afghanistan. That same argument was made about Iraq, and it's just as phony now as it was then. The question is not about abandoning Afghanistan. It is about correctly defining and achieving our goals there. Unlike Iraq, we also hear arguments pointing out that the 9-11 attacks were launched from Afghanistan, which is absolutely true. But the leaders of al-Qaeda and the leaders of the Taliban are in Pakistan. They are not in Afghanistan. We should be concerned about al-Qaeda potentially reestablishing a safe haven in Afghanistan. But we should be even more concerned about al-Qaeda's current safe haven in Pakistan. Pakistan is home to a witch's brew of militancy, radicalism, terrorism, nuclear weapons, and weak civilian leadership. And getting this country right will be even more challenging and more important, Mr. President, than Afghanistan. Our primary goal should be to help support the emergence of a civilian government in Pakistan that is effective, democratic, and a reliable partner. It has been widely reported that elements of the Pakistani security services continue to provide support to militants. Our ability to pressure the Pakistani security forces to hold these elements accountable is undermined by our focus on military operations in Afghanistan, specifically our dependence upon our su supply line running through Pakistan. Some have suggested that if we redeploy troops from Afghanistan, the Pakistanis will decide we aren't committed to the region and we will lose that leverage we have over them. But in fact, we should consider whether drawing down our troops in Afghanistan will help enable us to deal with Pakistan from a position of strength. The Director of National Intelligence summarized uh, the depth of this problem earlier this year during his testimony before the Senate Select Committee on Intelligence. He stated, no improvement in the security in Afghanistan is possible without Pakistan taking control of its border areas and improving governance, creating economic and educational opportunities throughout the country. Mounting economic hardships and frustration over poor governance have given rise to greater radicalization. Islamabad needs to make painful reforms to improve overall macroeconomic stability. As Admiral Blair's testimony illustrates, militancy in the region stems from an incredibly complex set of problems, few of which are amenable to a military solution. Now that the United States is focused on its relationship with the civilian government in Pakistan, after too many years in which we placed all our chips on an unreliable, unpopular, and undemocratic strongman, we're finally on the right track, trying to support the emergence of a legitimate government that in the long run is more likely to support our counterterrorism goals and provide the stability that our country needs. Progress on that front, however, may well be compromised by our massive presence in Afghanistan. During a recent Senate Foreign Relations Committee hearing, former British Foreign Service Officer Rory Stewart testified, quote, U.S. operations in Afghanistan may, in fact, contribute to the destabilization of Pakistan. And Special Envoy Holbrook and Admiral Mullen have also acknowledged to me in appearances before the Foreign Relations Committee that there is a danger that our operations in Afghanistan will further destabilize Pakistan by pushing militants into that country. We must carefully consider the alternatives before we pursue a significant escalation in Afghanistan that is not likely to fix the governance problems of that country or to address the al-Qaeda presence in Pakistan and that could further destabilize the entire region. Mr. President, over the last eight years, we have committed tremendous resources in an effort to dramatically rework Afghan society. We have doubled our troop levels there over the past year, and this year alone, we will spend over $50 billion in that country. This has already become the deadliest year for U.S. troops in Afghanistan. Rather than doubling down on a strategy with objectives that may well be unachievable, we should focus on relentlessly pursuing al-Qaeda's network in Pakistan and around the world and set realistic goals for providing civilian assistance to legitimate actors uh, within the Afghan and Pakistani governments. My amendment asks tough questions about any potential military escalation to ensure that we carefully consider the costs of the proposed strategy, its likelihood of achieving our counterterrorism goals, and of course the potential pitfalls and the alternatives. I hope my colleagues will ask themselves those, these questions as they consider whether to support the underlying bill which funds a military approach in Afghanistan that is badly in need of rethinking. I thank the Chair and of course thank the